show what family they represent. The buttons were symbols of status and dignity, as well as identity. They were very fashionable in the 1800s and still exist among the nobility. Status or rank of the family was indicated by the coronet that appeared above the crest. Livery buttons showed when the head of a household was, a, was husbandless. And sometimes livery buttons had to be changed in order to represent the proper circumstances. An example of a change in livery buttons was in 1814 when the buttons on the livery of the footman of Marie Louise, wife of Napoleon I, still bore the imperial arms of France. Offensive remarks from Austrians caused her to have the buttons removed and replaced by those bearing her own monogram. The Tlingit and Haida and the other Indians of the Pacific Northwest had family crests, which they wore to show their ancestry in much the same way Europeans do. The wearing of each traditional design, usually a bird, animal, or supernatural being, was rigidly restricted to the families entitled to it. After Western great traders brought the needed materials to the Indians, the button blanket became a popular garment for formal wear. This ceremonial covering was made from a regular trade blanket by sewing large pearl buttons on it to form the crest. Charles Dickens recognized buttons as keys to character. This is from his digest all the year round. Show me a man's buttons and I will tell you his life and character and daily goings of his wife and daughters, if he had any, and if he has not, I can tell you this too, and of what manner of womanhood is his laundress and, and a room keeper. In the 1850s, the Duke of Edinburgh chewed buttons, but he didn't swallow them. They were used as an aid to reduce smoking. These are other uses of versatile buttons. Sailors used to cook a silver button with fish to find out if the fish was poisonous. If the fish turned black, the fish wasn't safe to eat. A Texas trail driver button was used to plug a bullet hole in the hat in the display of the Texas Museum. The hat had been worn by an old trail driver.
The center player has to guess who has the button until he guesses right. Then that player takes the place in the center and the game continues. In the past, children chanted rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, and Indian chief as they counted off buttons in sequence in this fortune telling game. Younger children have also liked to count off buttons, much like daisy petals, with he loves me, he loves me not. Over the years, buttons have provided us with entertaining sayings and scenes, starting with the Rebus button and risque buttons of the 1700s. They were popular forms of amusement, amusement first in France and then in England, and were designed to tax the imagination and provide a topic for conversation. Rufus buttons formed a riddle consisting of letters, numbers, or objects instead of words to express messages. During this period, these caricature buttons were a rage in France in um, entertaining satirical scenes depicting nobility were popular. King Louis XVI of France had the first pornographic lock and button in the 1700s. They were also worn in his court on dashing young dandies, which caused the ladies to blush. Whole sets depicted in minute detail the most salacious scenes from the loves of Argentino, a 15th century Italian who wrote erotic satire. Buttons as therapy. Button collecting and crafting have provided creative, healthy outlets for people and lifted from them from depressions. The activities formally started with button charm strings in the 1800s. However, it wasn't until the 1830s when lack of money, lack of metal for zippers, rationing of gasoline for travel, and the appearance of plastic buttons that button collecting became one of the most popular hobbies in the United States. The novelty of plastic buttons made people laugh. They even came on gaily printed cards, complete with verses like Ladybug, Ladybug, Burton and Gay, Bring Me Luck, The Live Long Day. Collecting them was an inexpensive diversion that took people's minds off World War II. Buttons became a widespread antidote for the dull room, and today collecting them is still a relaxing hobby that combats loneliness and boredom. Um, there's something this is still therapy. There's something soothing about the gentle click and crunch of buttons as they are poured from a jar. Something satisfying about a handful of buttons and about sorting buttons by color, size, shape, and themes. A sentiment of button collectors is that they like the tactile part of buttons, being able to hold a little bit of history in your hand. One collector in Canada said, you can collect stamps, but you can't handle stamps. In 19, 89, Bertha Whitliff found this tactile experience provided by buttons to be greatly effective treatment in, home, in her home for disabled children. She was a button collector and had a plastic life-size bathtub full of buttons. She set the children in the tub with buttons and even the hyperactive ones sorted and scooped for as long as eight hours at a time. They often remained calm after their playtime. In the early 1900s, a small group of men organized the American Buttonist Society with the purpose of supplementing history by evidence from old buttons found on ancient and modern battlefields and campsites. They added much to the existing knowledge of early historical events through their excavations and studies of the many buttons they found. They were especially helpful in tracing numerous events from the American Revolution and War of 1812. Our historians have found buttons to be useful for identifying works of art. One example is a bust, which was originally said to be of Oliver H. Perry, who was a United States Navy officer and hero in the War of 1812. That is now questioned because of coat buttons, uh, which are similar to those of a Confederate field officer. Genealogists study buttons, study buttons bearing family crests to illuminate history. A family's identity can be traced through the crests that appear on livery buttons. Buttons in the bank, the button business. There's much evidence that buttons have been used as currency throughout history, beginning as early as the 1500s. Buttons continue to have buying power in many parts of the world where natives accept buttons in their trading deals. The button industry has paid, played a part in the economic life in England since
seems here as if God had only created men for making buttons. The American button business started after the American Revolution. Yankee peddlers carried buttons from town to town in small tin trucks, trunks held on their backs.